Welcome to today's webinar, Compatible Use and Development with Military Installations, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning. My name is Sarah Deal. I am the Compatible Use Community Planning Liaison at the Maryland Department of Planning. This webinar is brought to you by the Maryland Department of Planning in partnership with the Mid-Atlantic Planning Collaboration and on behalf of the Smart Growth Network. As you will learn from today's webinar, the DOD is heavily invested in the Mid-Atlantic region, in part due to the proximity to the nation's capital. Between just Maryland, West Virginia, and Virginia, there are over 40 different military bases, making the military a major economic driver for the Mid-Atlantic. MDP appreciates the Mid-Atlantic Planning Collaboration's assistance in marketing today's webinar. We're recording this webinar and we'll be posting it on our website under the Past Webinar Recordings tab on smartgrowth.org. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter e to learn about upcoming webinars. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. The views expressed by the speakers in this webinar are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the State of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is Compatible Use and Development with Military Installations. You can also search for event number 9219523. I have a great panel joining me today, including Jennifer Chason, Todd Besser, Bruce Sturck, Sabrina Hecht, and Christopher Zimmerman. I'll be introducing each panelist with a brief bio, but please refer to the panelist biography page under handouts to learn more about each of our presenters. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Sarah Deal and I'm the Maryland Department of Planning's Compatible Use Community Planning Liaison. I am leading the development of Maryland's first compatible use website and handbook, which are resources that will guide compatible community development in support of the long-term mission sustainability, mission resiliency, and operability of military operations throughout the state. Jennifer Chason, is a grants program manager with the Office of Military and Federal Affairs at the Maryland Department of Commerce. She is currently managing Maryland's Commerce's grants for the Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation, OLTC, and a Regional Innovation Strategies grant from the US DOC Economic Development Administration, as well as eight other state grants to Maryland's various military alliances. Sabrina Hecht is the Community Planning Liaison Officer for Naval Air Station Patuxent River, Maryland. Since 2008, she has worked as a community planner for NAVFACS uh, in Naval District, Washington, partnering with St. Mary's County on a road maintenance agreement. She chairs the Regional Transportation Initiative, is part of Team PACS implementing the Readiness Environmental Program Integration, REPI, and is the Air Installations Compatible Use Zone subject matter expert. Sabrina is a retired, retired colonel having served multiple combat tours. Uh, Bruce Stark is the Director of Federal Facility Support for the City of Hampton, Virginia. He is responsible for leading and directing the City of Hampton's efforts to partner and build relationships with National Aeronautics and Space Administration Langley Research Center, uh, Joint Base Langley Eustis, Hampton Veterans Affairs Medical Center, and other federal organizations. He functions as a member of the executive management team for the City of Hampton and is the executive director for the City Council appointed Hampton Federal Area Development Authority Board. He also serves as a principal staff support to the Fort Monroe Authority, which is responsible for the activities associated with the closure of Fort Monroe as a result of the 2005 BRAC, as well as the Fort Monroe National Monument. Mr. Stirk retired from the United States Air Force as a colonel in November 2006. Todd Besser is an Environmental Protection Specialist for Aberdeen Proving Ground, Director of Public Works. Todd has worked for the Army since 2002, beginning with Army Environmental Command at APG, then transitioning to the garrison in 2008. He serves as a subject matter expert for coastal zone management, leads Army support of several Chesapeake Bay research and monitoring programs, and serves as the environmental point of contact for the APG joint land use study. He also leads the APG Army Compatible Use Buffer Team, which is the Army implementation of the REPI program. Last but not least, Chris Zimmerman currently supports the 316th Wing on Joint Base Andrews as a community planning liaison and works closely with various Prince George's County departments, the Maryland Office of Federal and Military Affairs, and other federal agencies to identify innovative solutions that mitigate mission sustainment challenges, improve military installation resilience, and build mutually beneficial partnerships that support JBA's mission. We have a great panel assembled for this morning, and I thank each and every one of you for joining me on this webinar. Following our presentations, we will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime by using the questions tool in the control panel located on the right side of your screen.
Uh, before we get started, we'll launch a quick poll to help better understand our audience. If you're unable to respond to the poll by clicking, please try exiting full screen mode. <sighs> Do not worry. Is it working? So it looks like we've encountered a technical difficulty or two with the poll, so uh, we'll skip that, which is not a problem. Do my presentation back up. Okay, well, we'll just skip today's poll and we'll just go ahead and right, uh, kick off the presentations for this morning. Sorry about that. So to kick off today's webinar, I wanna talk about what compatible use planning is in relation to military readiness and community development. I will also be giving a high level overview of what a few communities and state governments across the country are doing to strengthen communication and coordination between installations in the surrounding jurisdictions, including the state of Maryland's compatible use project, which is currently underway. I will then be turning it over to the other panelists who will be showcasing specific best practices and resources that installations and communities in the Mid-Atlantic region are utilizing to support military installations, neighboring jurisdictions, and the DOD mission. So what is compatibility and encroachment? The relationship between military installations and the surrounding communities has become strongly interrelated and it's becoming more and more important for the military, state and local governments, and other stakeholder groups to work collaboratively to protect military training capabilities while conserving important natural resources and maintaining community well-being. The best way to ensure civilian and military compatibility and maintain the long-term viability of the military's economic benefit to the state, while also ensuring um, communities the opportunity to grow and expand, is to continue to promote coordination, collaboration, and cooperation among all of our relevant stakeholders. So compatible use planning refers to working to ensure that both existing and planned land uses and activities are carefully considered to reduce or eliminate adverse effects or to enhance and support neighboring or nearby land uses. In relationship to military readiness, compatibility refers to the balance and or compromise between community and military needs and interests with the goal of promoting an environment where both can coexist successfully. Compatible development with military installations can be achieved if local, county, and state governments coordinate their efforts with military installations and vice versa to promote and achieve compatible use. When we're talking about encroachment, um, this is another term that you'll hear a lot about today. Uh, it goes hand in hand with compatibility planning. Um, encroachment refers to any deliberate action by a governmental or non-governmental entity that does or is likely to inhibit or impede current or future military activities within the installation footprint. Encroachment also refers to deliberate military activity that is or is likely to be incompatible with the use of the community's resources. Um, so some examples of challenge areas of encroachment are seen um, in those images there to the left. Uh, it's important to note that encroachment is certainly a two-way street and means different things to a variety of different people. Um, so to a civilian that lives near an airfield, it might be the noise of a jet engine that disturbs their favorite TV show. Um, but if you're the airfield's commander, the encroachment might be the housing development that presses closer and closer to a runway or the fence line that's seen in that bottom image. Um, working collaborati collaboratively, military, state, and local governments and other stakeholders can protect military training capabilities while conserving important natural resources and maintaining community well-being. So why is compatible use important? Why, why are we talking about this today? Successful compatible use planning brings benefits for both the military installations and the surrounding communities. When civilian activities that are incompatible are present, they can threaten the installation's mission, which could potentially lead to a loss of that mission to another installation, this could possibly be in another state, or even the loss of that installation as a whole. This boils down to a loss of jobs, revenue, and other negative economic impacts on the surrounding community. As Jenny will explain later in her presentation, 
uh, military installation presence in the community is often a major economic driver, not only for the community itself, but also the, the state. Additionally, to maintain the country's military edge, troops must have the best and most realistic training and preparation. Restrictions that are caused by increased, increased growth and development can have a detrimental impact on the military's ability to train as we fight. When the military community and the local state governments work together on compatible use land planning, there's an opportunity to minimize impacts and maximize benefits in areas where the military and communities intersect. There's also an opportunity to appropriate plan for infrastructure demands based on military operations, and this could include housing, transportation, network improvements, and other public resources. So across the country, um, different states and communities with a strong military presence are taking steps to promote increased communication and coordination in support of responsible compatible use planning practices, which is what we're talking about today. Um, to give you a couple examples, in Washington State, the Department of Commerce has recently issued a Washington State Guidebook on Military and Community Compatibility, which consists of compatibility planning guidance and implementation tools intended for use uh, by community members and planning professionals alike. Uh, similarly, similarly, in California, uh, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research collaborated with local, state, and federal stakeholders to develop a 2016 update to their advisory planning handbook. So this book was originally published in 2006, and its primary purpose is to guide city and county planners, um, property owners, development or developers, excuse me, and military personnel on how to best engage and collaborate on different proactive planning efforts and also encourage land use compatibility and also um, reduce encroachment on military installations in different operating areas. So finally, meanwhile in Florida, and these are just a couple high level examples, there's plenty of other options or opportunities across the country. Um, but in Florida, they're working hard to mitigate encroachment to military installations through a set of different laws that are designed to set aside conservation lands, um, regulate land use and notify military authorities of possible incompatible development. So the state has also established several land acquisition programs to help buffer um, military installations. And links to all these resources are uh, will be available in this presentation when it's sent out. You can click on uh, the images and it'll take you right to these guidebooks and, and handbooks. So to get closer to home and, and talk about what uh, Maryland's compatible use program uh, the U.S. Department of Defense is a major supporter of increased coordination between communities and installations with, certain, with a variety of different grant programs through the Office of De Local Defense Community Cooperation, so Old, C Old CC. Um, this funding allows communities to study and address compatible use challenges, uh, climate resiliency, and local infrastructure that's going to be used by military personnel. So many aspects of those example efforts that I just highlighted were supported by old CC funding opportunities. The Maryland Department of Planning, in partnership with the Maryland Department of Commerce, has recently been awarded a grant by old CC to launch a second phase of its compatible use project. Um, while Jennifer will also go into more detail following this presentation on the larger grant effort as a whole, um, and the role of the Department of Commerce and some of those other finer details, I quickly want to talk about the Department of Planning's role in this grant effort through the development of the state's first compatible use website and handbook. So the purpose of this project is to provide Maryland and the surrounding regions with resources and frameworks that will guide compatible community development, uh, supporting long-term sustainability, mission resiliency, and operability of military operations throughout the state. These resources will guide and facilitate the implementation of recommendations from the statewide joint land use response implementation strategy that was completed in 2019. In this study, compatibility issues were identified as concerns that the state should address to support compatible land use between military and different local communities. Examples of resources that are being compiled as part of this website and handbook, um, compiled and developed, include best practices for communication and coordination, guidance for the development of compatible use studies, which are formerly joint land use studies, and sample language for model local ordinances that jurisdictions could consider, as well as a compatibility mapping review tool. Intended audiences for these resources include military communities and members, state and local leaders, and the general public. Development of this website and handbook is a stakeholder-driven process and is being completed in collaboration with the consultant team. Over 50 stakeholders, including some that are on this call today, from military installations, uh, local and state government, and community organizations have been divided into two groups, a policy committee and an implementation work group, and meet monthly 
um, to discuss available resources, how to best develop new resources for Maryland's military communities, and also talk about um, overall website design and, and content. So finally, um, if you or your organization would like to get involved or would like to stay up to date on project pro progress, um, please visit the project website and sign up for updates or feel free to email me. Uh, we'll be starting the public outreach process in the late summer, early fall, and are compiling a list of target groups to engage with in a smaller virtual setting and also um, to get our survey out to. Um, we want to make sure that we engage with our target audience on all different levels, whether that be the military installations, local and state leaders, community organizations, and the general public in order to provide the most beneficial set of resources. So if you have any questions regarding this presentation, uh, make sure you drop them in the questions box and we will cover them at the end of today's webinar. And with that, I will turn it over to Jennifer Chason. Welcome, Jenny. Thank you, Sarah. If you'll bear with me, I'm just gonna share my screen. Hopefully that is the correct screen. It looks like it. Yep, we are good to go. Thank you. All right. Okay, good morning. I'm Jennifer Chason, Grants Program Manager with the Office of Military Federal Affairs under the Maryland Department of Commerce. And on behalf of Commerce, I want to thank you for joining us here today. I will pre be presenting on the State of Maryland's Compatible Use Project, a project that is a joint effort with the Maryland Department of Planning. Uh, Sarah covered what compatible use is and why it's important. I think in the case of Maryland specifically, this map is a good visual of the military presence in Maryland and why compatible use between military and civilian communities is important. We have a lot of installations and people in our relatively small geographic area. Maryland has 20 military facilities and 12 uh, major installations. These spaces perform critical work on behalf of the nation and support key industries such as aerospace, cybersecurity, and biosciences. According to an FY16 study commissioned by Maryland Commerce from Towson University's Regional Economic Studies Institute, Maryland's major military installations account for $55.5 billion in economic output. This represents nearly one-sixth of the state's total gross domestic product. Additionally, according to USAspending.gov, about $33 billion in federal contract spending was performed in Maryland over the last 12 months, and Maryland ranks number one in federal R&D federal obligations, uh, consistently ranks. Um, for defense spending, for defense spending specifically, Maryland consistently ranks among the top five states in the country for defense spending and recently ranked second for Army small business spending. Federal and defense spending are a critical part of Maryland's economy, and as such, projects like the Compatible Use Project look to protect the economic impact from, protect, from potential adverse impacts like commercial or residential development that may encroach upon their footprint. In order to protect the economic vitality of our military installations, Maryland Commerce decided to pursue a compatible use grant from the DOD's Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation in 2017 in order to promote compatible civilian development in Maryland that would support long-term military sustainability and support continued regional community development around installations. This grant offered us a statewide perspective to identify ways to address compatible use issues. Receipt of this grant followed the completion of five local joint land use studies and installations in Maryland. Those JLU studies included recommendations to improve compatible use between the installations and surrounding communities to prevent encroachment. Data from these studies were used as a, as a part of a, the data collection and fact finding portion of our phase one compatible use grant, as were interviews from key defense community stakeholders and state agencies who would later play a key role in the implementation of recommended activities. This project included the development of a statewide joint land use response implementation strategy, or SJRIS, which was completed in early 2019. This slide has links to the report itself and the executive summary. One of the recommendations was to establish procedures for permitting renewable energy development that enables military compatibility and community economic development. This included three implementation activities, an in-depth study of wind energy development and military mission, develop a process and procedure for siting large wind and solar farms, and develop statewide red-yellow-green mapping for siting alternative energy projects. 
In terms of the overall project, this graph is a quick look at where we are now, where we have been, and where we are going. The 2017 grant is shown here as Phase 1A. After the completion of the SJRIS report in 2019, the Maryland Commerce spent the remainder of that year planning and applying for an implementation grant with the help of an implementation planning committee formulated with key stakeholders identified in the SJRIS for implementation. This planning period is known as Phase 1B in the chart you see here. Since then, the Office of Military and Federal Affairs applied for and won a compatible use implementation grant from the DOD's Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation in June 2020 to implement specific, specific recommendations from the SJRIS report as identified by the planning committee or phase two or the implementation phase. Phase three will be an ongoing continuation of the activities we plan to implement in phase two. After the completion of the SJRIS report in early 2019 and the distribution of the report in spring 2019, the Maryland Com Commerce convened a, convened a committee of stakeholders to plan uh, phase two of the project. This committee included representatives from installations in Maryland, representatives from the Maryland Association of Counties and the Maryland Municipal League, and state agency partners who were referenced in the SJRIS as taking a lead role in implementation. The committee met multiple times in the summer and fall of 2019 and decided to focus on these areas for the phase two project based on feasibility, interest, funds available, and under other factors. The first area being communication and coordination issues, the top compatibility factor that came up in every JLUS conducted in the state with multiple issues in this factor for each report. This would be addressed through outreach and awareness building activities, including outreach to the community to build awareness of this effort and to engage them in its activities, building awareness of Maryland's military footprint and organization of military, state, and community stakeholders in order to create or improve in communication and coordination policies and procedures and tools, like planning notification areas, to promote compatible use and prevent encroachment. Maryland Planning is leading the implementation of these activities through various stakeholder groups, as Sarah mentioned earlier. We also wanted to focus on educating and providing technical assistance to local communities and planners on compatible use practices and guidances and to engage them more in this process. Sarah provided an overview of the compatible use website and handbook in her presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to reach up to, out to her about that project. Lastly, we decided on implementing a renewable energy compatible siting project that would develop mapping tools that would help energy developers understand where siting would be compatible with military activities in the state and also help the state to understand the current state of compatibility as it relates to renewable energy projects in Maryland and also find ways to address or create mechanisms to improve compatible energy siting in Maryland. As part of our compatible use implementation grant, Maryland Commerce is leading the implementation of a renewable energy compatible siting project. This is a timely and important project. The 2019 Maryland General Assembly Senate Bill 516 mandated that the state increase its renewable energy portfolio, requiring that 50% of the energy spent in Maryland come from renewable energy sources by the year 2030. In order to meet these goals in a way that would not adversely impact our military operations in Maryland, Commerce engaged a vendor Matrix Design Group to execute the project. Commerce and Matrix formed, organized, and are leading a steering committee to guide the execution of the project activities. The steering committee includes, but is not limited to, members from the Maryland military installations, relevant state agencies, local community organizations, the DOD Military Aviation and Installation Assurance Site and Clearinghouse, and other federal partners, the Maryland Public Service Commission, representatives from the renewable energy industry, and other subject matter experts. The first deliverable in the project is the creation of ArcGIS maps that provide data on areas where renewable energy development in the state could be incompatible with military operations. This task involves collecting and analyzing data and creating energy siting mapping layers in order to inform energy developers and jurisdictions with planning and zoning authority where projects are or would be incompatible with military mission. Military operational data included in the tool will include, but is not limited to, military training routes, special use airspace, radar view sheds, and areas of concern outlined by the DOD. The military footprint will be overlaid with existing data like wind and solar energy potential and the Smart DG Plus tool, managed by the Maryland Department of Natural Resources Power Plant Research Program. These mapping layers are intended to be utilized by renewable energy developers when making smart project siting decisions and will provide them with contacts for the DOD and areas of the state that may require project coordination 
in order to be compatible with military installation footprints in the state. The second deliverable will be an energy siting compatibility study that will provide the state with the current status of energy siting process and projects in Maryland and suggest potential processes or procedures and local mod model ordinances to address siting of renewable energy projects that would be compatible with military operations. The goal of this project is to take a proactive approach to compatible siting, one that balances Maryland's aggressive renewable energy goals with the importance of sustaining military operations in the state and their respective economic impact. In addition to bi-monthly committee meetings, Matrix Design Group also held stakeholder interviews with all steering committee members, as well as the National Guard, military installations outside of Maryland where military operations could be impacted by development in the state, and local communities where development could adversely impact military operations in their county or city. The goal of these interviews was to gather information on existing operations and permitting processes in order to understand what information could be gathered and what was missing. In order to develop the missing layers, the mapping layers, map matrix, released requests for information to many of the parties who were interviewed in the project in order to gather existing data, including requests for GIS data. In order to understand how local communities could use the tool in their permitting process, Matrix will undertake case studies with two communities where wind energy potential is the greatest within military operational areas. St. Mary's County, home of NAS Patuxent River and Webster Field in Caroline County, which is under military airspace managed by the Delaware National Guard within the NAS Pax River radar view shed and it is also at a high risk for adverse impacts from development. Once the data is collected, cleaned and organized, the team will analyze the data and prepare the mapping layers for integration into the Smart DG Plus mapping tool. The study will provide a report on current siting processes and legislation for renewable energy projects. Note that in Maryland, projects that generate more than two megawatts of energy with exceptions are required to go through the state's Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity or CPCN process for large scale utility siting. Community scale projects or projects that are smaller than two megawatts are permitted by the local or county government if local permitting processes for wind and solar energy projects exist. The study will also develop model legislation and ordinances using best practices implemented by other states to guide compatible renewable energy siting. A questionnaire has been issued in order to gain feedback on those suggested best practices. The study's recommendations will take into account this feedback in the final product. A few important things to note, the tool is not a policy tool or a tool meant to influence policy, but is informational in nature and meant for coordination purposes only. With this project, the state is not leasing areas nor sites for renewable energy development, uh, nor is the state creating exclusionary areas, blocking off areas of the state where renewable energy development is not allowed. Additionally, the map will include military operational areas, including missions that may originate outside of the state, provided that development within the state would be impacted by those missions. Lastly, the mapping layers will show military, military operational areas and offshore waters or development that is more than three miles off the eastern shore of Maryland. However, the mapping layers will not prescribe any analysis to those areas due to those waters being under federal jurisdiction for all siting matters. Users, users will be instead referred to the Bureau for Ocean Management if interested in offshore wind leases. As to the study, it's important to note that the model ordinances or suggested legislation will likely be related to the military compatibility mapping layers and how to integrate the tool into the CPCN process. For example, during the pre-application discovery phase or a local permitting process. Any suggested best practices will take into account the questionnaire feedback. These suggested tools and guidance are not prescriptive or restrictive in any way. That's it for me. Um, there's a lot more to this grant and the Renewable Energy Compatible Siting Project. So if you have any questions that I can't answer during the Q&A portion, here's my contact info, as well as the information for planning, um, should you like to reach out about this project. Thank you. And now we're going to uh, pass it over to Sabrina Hecht from uh, Naval Air Station Patuxent River. Sabrina, if you want to go into full screen mode. All right, can you hear me? Full screen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. There we go. Is 
Is it in full screen mode now? Yes. You're I'm good. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Sabrina Hecht. I'm the Community Planning Liaison Officer for NES Pax River. I have been working encroachment prevention and mitigation for approximately 10 years. Previously, I worked for St. Mary's County in planning and zoning. St. Mary's County is where NES Pax is located. The relationships I formed while working for St. Mary's County and the subsequent immersion in the local community has proven to be a very successful combination when it comes to partnerships, collaboration, compatible use, and just getting the job done. So today I'm gonna to show you um, several projects and programs that um, I've worked with at the local, state, and federal level that has been very successful. So let me just give you a little bit of a background. So Naval Air Station, if you're not familiar, is located in Southern Maryland. St. Mary's County, approximately 60 miles south of DC. We have a mix of urban, rural, and industrial uses. The Amish community actually has a large presence here as well, which was once um, a sought after tobacco farming community and waterman community. The county now relies on the jobs and industry brought in by the Navy. Today, the population for all of St. Mary's County is 113,000, uh, but NAS PACS employs over 25,000. So if you see this next slide, this is the Atlantic test range. Not only are we on the ground, we are in the sky and, and um, our aircraft operate and are tested all over from the northern neck of Virginia in the lower left-hand corner to the eastern shore, all the way to Delaware and of course, uh, Southern Maryland. So I'm just gonna give you a brief history of Pax River, why this is important. So NES was commissioned on April 1st, 1943 to support the efforts during World War II. Today, those aircraft that you see in the background are still standing and being used today to house and maintain the aircraft we test. That was 78 years ago. Under the BRAC move in the 1990s, when NAVAIR moved to Pax, the population on base went from under 10,000 to over the 25,000 that we have today. What was a two lane road is now an eight lane road. Why is this all important? Because without collaboration from our local state and federal officials, we wouldn't be the premier research, evaluation, development and testing of all Navy and Marine Corps aircraft we are today. So here's a nice picture. We have a lot of pictures in the archives. Um, you can see that's a Grubman TBM-3W Avenger to today's Joint Strike Fighter testing over Pax River. I think it's a pretty cool one. Um, if you've never been here, it's really a sight to see and the mission will continue long into the next century. So my job here is to prevent and mitigate encroachment. Every day I see the natural and built beauty of NAS Pax which is why I'm, I'm so passionate about it. So really quickly, just three takeaways. We have over 50 tenants here, uh, three types of aircraft, fixed wing, rotary wing, unmanned aerial systems, and Pax River contributes 7.5 billion to the Maryland economy. And uh, we can't stress that, how important that is. So I'm gonna talk kind of extensively about the AQs, but not as extensively as I'd like to, because we're only getting 10 minutes. But um, why, why is this so important? I think that this is one of the first collaborations for compatible use um, that happened in the Navy. Why, why did we need to work with our local counterpart parts? Because the AQs is the Air Installation Compatible Use Zone. The first in the Navy was in 1979, although St. Mary's County adopted it in 75 because it took the Navy that long to actually adopt it. So what this is, it's an overlay that's encumbered by existing development land. So it was updated in 2009 because we had a new mix of aircraft, the F-35, and then we also completed one at our outlying Webster Field, which is where mostly our unmanned aerial systems go. So I'm gonna show you quickly. So what, what is the APZ? Why is it important? I feel like a picture shows a thousand words. This is not here at Pax River. This actually happened in Virginia. Um, an F-18 crashed in APZ 
two, accident potential zone two, in an apartment complex. Um, luckily, there is no injury somehow, but these are the type of uses you do, don't want in your accident potential zone. So here at Pax River, we've been working on this for decades. You can see here on this next slide, this is the original AQs at the bottom, 1975. One of the things that um, was recommended was that consideration should be given to relocating three schools, the Frank Knox School, George Washington Carver, and Lexington Park. Well, all three of those since then, since 1975, have been relocated. And, and I'm gonna show you that in a couple more slides. But here's our, eight, our footprint today. Uh, you look at the gray area, that's NAS Pax River. The yellow is the clear zone, that's on base. We have APZ1, Accident Potential Zone 1, which is in the red area, most of that is on base. And then you've got APZ2, which is in the blue. Um, and you can see where the gray and the white ends to the left-hand side, that's off base. So all those areas off base prior to 1979, when this was um, adopted, you know, had businesses, schools, residences, which some of these are not compatible. So today we're still trying to get move towards compatibility. These are our, um, as part of the AQs is also our no, noise, uh, noise zones, excuse me, those um, extend out into the Chesapeake, which isn't a problem, but um, also into Calvert County. So relocation of facilities outside the accident potential zones, not only do we need to have compatible use off base, but we need to have compatible use on base. So if you look on the right hand side, it says existing barracks to be relocated, P975, that was an accident potential zone one. These barracks were built in the early 70s and they've actually been built. The, the Milcon went through, this is an older slide, um, and it was, has been moved to the town center. So that was definitely a success story. Then um, you move to the center of the slide, existing clinic to be lo relocated. Bumed is working on a $60 million project to make a bigger and better clinic, and that is going to be moved to the town center as well. And then and our child development center, I think everybody knows that all bases are, are really hurting. There's a long wait list for the child De development center. So um, a new one needed to be built. They were gonna put an addition on the old one. And when the APZs were updated in 2009, they realized they needed to go um, to the town center. So, so that new CDC has been built. So there's some success stories out in town. I'm just gonna go to the next slide and uh, show you uh, the map of that. <clears throat> so this next slide, this is where it, out in town, this is where it runs through it. If you see gate two, that's um, Pax Riverside, and then that's 235 that bisects it. Um, the Frank Knox Elementary School was was closed. It was given to the Navy, and it's now our training center, but at least there's not children in there in the accident potential zone. The old library, if you move down there, which is now a, a theater, that was moved to all the way, you go to the left, that's where the new library is out outside of the AQs. And then we have an old firehouse, which is now, um, I think it's a lawnmower store or it's a restore, but it's a compatible use in APZ2 and the new fi firehouse moved out in town. So this is the AQs way ahead. Um, we're working towards compatibility both on and off base through relocations, consolidations, mill cons. Um, we've worked with St. Mary's County on their Lexington Park Development District Master Plan, moving some of those businesses into out of the AQs into the Business District Park, which is further up 235. We're looking at tax incentives, updating their comprehensive plan, as well as implementation at Webster Outlying Field. So, this is just kind of a list of all the collaboration, um, not all of it, but some of the collaboration that we've worked with, with local, state, and federal officials. And I'm gonna just go through the couple slides about them. I can't talk about everything because they only gave us 10 minutes, but um, here's some more collaboration. This, When you go back and look at it, maybe you can take notes or if you have any questions, you can obviously call me at the end. So one of my um, passionate, projects is the, the REPI program. 
program. Um, I know somebody else is going to be discussing that, so I just really wanted to show this one slide. Uh, this was one of the projects. So from left to right, that's Melanie McGinnis, Lindsay Bargesco. They're from the Atlantic Test Range, and that's me on the right, Sabrina Hecht. Uh, this is Snow Hill Park. This was about an 140 acre property that was in private hands and instead of being cut up and developed on the Patuxent River, St. Mary's County purchased this with open space funds as well as um, we NES PACs put a repre easement on this and now it is a park. As soon as they purchased it, it was open within a month. You can go grabbing there. Um, kayaking and just a nature walk and they're doing improvements every single day on it i've been there it's a great place to go if you ever come there it's open to the public um, sand gates road look it up snow hill park okay this was a not so um, happy meeting but this meeting was um, a pfas meeting if you haven't heard about pfas and military installations um there has AFFF, Aqueous Film Foaming Forum, which is used to fight fires um, for aircraft, you can't use water, has been used for decades by um, military installations, as well as PFAS is in other compounds, it's in water bottles and toys and things like that. Well, the EPA came up and said that this is a toxic chemical, so the bases have been working their best to try to investigate and um, clean up PFAS that has contaminate, potentially contaminated on base and off base. So there was a public meeting outside of the base. This included our Maryland Department of Environment, our Health Department, county officials, the base installation commanding officer, our environmental staff, and um, we all came together to kind of give a public meeting to understand, you know, what what does this mean? How is it affecting the community? What the Navy is doing to mitigate any problems associated with PFAS? Well, these were some of the people who came to the meeting. There was approximately 300 there. Um, it was very interesting, I have to say, but we all came together to really um, help mitigate those fears. And we've had subsequent meetings and we're still working on it. But this is, you know, everything's not always happy, but this was one of the meetings. Here's a happy meeting. So um, this was our installation commanding officer a couple years ago, um, Captain Jason Hammond. And he was part of the ribbon cutting ceremony for FDR Boulevard. F FDR Boulevard is a parallel road to. bus traffic because we do have um, an issue with traffic and urban encroachment so opening this road was very important to um, Pax River as well as the community and then on the right hand side that is the Commissioner President Guy for St. Mary's County and there they are signing jointly the intergovernmental support agreement and I will go over more of that in our subsequent slides um, here's another work on collaboration we had our multimodal study. Um, this was part of the Metropolitan Planning Organization between Calvert County, St. Mary's County, and NAS PACs. Uh, we had over 2,500 responses on what people would like to see to help the traffic issue going to PACs, um, mitigate it, whether that was bus systems coming out, more bike lanes. And this was our public meeting at the Naval Air Station um, Museum. And then on the right, right hand side, it was just a bike to work day. day. Uh, that was a fun day. I'm, I'm in there in the back. But anyway, um, you know, stressing the importance of multimodal. Uh, the community came together. We started at uh, the parking lot in Wildwood. We got permission there. And um, the BASEO even, not this one, but it was a previous year, he actually rode his bike into town and we used the Pax Velo biking team to kind of navigate our way in there. So, you know, important urban encroachment traffic is, is a definite um, encroachment issue. Okay, the next one is COVID collaboration. 
uh, this was this was new. This was brand new for everyone. And um, because of my relationship with St. Mary's County, they called me at like 12 o'clock on a Friday and said, Sabrina, we need you to come to our EOC in St. Mary's County to the uh, COVID meeting. So I showed up um, within an hour and um, got them in touch with our health officer at the clinic. Previously, you know, the Navy clinics were kind of just worked with only what was on base and worked with um, military members and, <clears throat> sorry, um, I'm losing the word, but they, we did not collaborate out in town. Well, today we now have a relationship with the health department, um, the clinic does. So it was, it, was, we, it was needed, obviously, for this pandemic. And then on the right-hand side, um, this is TechPort. This was, um, we were trying to come up with the masks, as you see on the left. Uh, there was no masks. How could we make them? TechPort is an agency at the um, airport, the local airport. And you'll see that's Governor Hogan's representative for Southern Maryland, Gretchen Hardiman. So all these groups were coming together to make this prototype for this mask as you see on the next page. And this is our security guard um, who was using the prototype for the mask. Uh, and again, this was all in the, the beginning stages of the COVID and we're still working together today. Lancaster Park, this is a great program that we have. Um, it used to be military housing. It is outside the fence line, but it is Navy property and it's 46 acres. St. Mary's County has leased this park for in-kind consideration since 1998. Uh, lots of things happen there. There's a dog park, there's a playground, um, walking trails, turf fields, basketball courts, and it's just a great place for the community to come together and patrons of Pax River don't have to pay any fees for it. Next slide, Defense Community Infrastructure Program. If you haven't heard about it, um, this is the second year. St. Mary's County submitted um, for a crosswalk at our Gate 2 and Great Mills Road. It's gonna be approximately $520,000. It's a tier two resilience project. And as you can see, um, the only crosswalk they have is actually across Great Mills Road. Um, but trying to get across to Gate 2, which is in the upper right-hand corner, um, there's no sidewalks, that building that, you know, the three tiers there, that's Frank Knox. Um, there's nothing there. So we put the uh, project in, the installation commanding officer uh, had to put a letter of support, which he did. Our environmental folks will help support the NEPA documentation. And we will know on August 13th whether Pax River was able to get the money or actually St. Mary's County was able to get the money for this, this great grant program. The next thing is the Intergovernmental Support Agreement. Um, this is the first one in Naval District, Washington. The initial agreement was $250,000 and then it was renewed in 2020 for up to 2 million. So why is this important? Because this road maintenance agreement, St. Mary's County was able to do multiple projects a lot quicker than our boss contractor and it freed up our contracting requirements to work on more critical things like milk cons, runway repair. So I'll show you a couple of them. Um, this is our um, River's Edge. This is our catering and conference center on base. You can see that there was like no lines at all in the parking lot and um, they completed it in eight hours that quickly. Um, that was important. Next slide. Um, this is the Patuxent River Naval Air Museum, where the aircraft are actually parked on the apron is Pax River's um, property, but we have an agreement with um, the museum, and you can see like the cracks in the grass, and you know that wasn't very pretty. And we want to make this, you know, the premier uh, aircraft research and development, and come to this beautiful museum. So. Um, the IGSA was able enable to fix that and um, it looks beautiful today. So one other thing, um, collaboration. Uh, we have aircraft here. Sometimes there's an emergency and one of our search and rescue vehicle, search and rescue helo helicopters went down. This is just a couple miles from base. Again, it's very rural here. And here is later on um, where the pilots came back. 
um, and gave the landowner a picture of the aircraft that went down as well as um, you know a thank you and that's actually Charlie Sasser I've known him for years and um, one of not this farm but another farm of his is in the Repi program but they were just happy that you know nobody was hurt so that collaboration goes a long way um, good things uh, do happen so how do I interface with our county government this is a list of items. Um, this is just some of them. And there, there's probably a meeting every week um, or something that I need to review or forward to our Atlantic test range to make sure that you know what they're doing is compatible. What are my tools that I work with? Encroachment Action Plan, Encroachment Status Report, the REPI Program, Joint Land Use Study, which was completed in 2015, the new one, um, the AQs, and then we have joint commissioner meetings two times a year. That's just a small portion of it. So here's our encroachment management team on base. We meet twice, every once every two months. Um, this is the leadership involved. We talk about um, any encroachment issues. We've talked about the REPI program and it's a very um, frequency sp spectrum, you name it. It's, it's a very robust um, group and uh, we, we make a lot of money doing working on this. So what are my parting thoughts? You need to understand the mission of the base, the mission of the community, and a lot of the stuff that I do happens to do with the AQs. You need to go to regular meetings with your local planning and zoning, your elected officials, and just get out there. Um, you want to try to work to make uses compatible and how do you do that you got to look for you know ways to do that tax incentives um, with the DCIP you know we, we need to make sure that that crosswalk is put in somehow and if we can get some grant funding we'll do that you know you have a limited budget and um, landowners and citizens are effective and you need to get out of the office and, and off base um, well, we'll wait for questions till the end, but here's my information if you have any questions. Thank you very much. That's all I have. All right, now we're going to turn it over to Bruce Sturt. Thanks so much, Sabrina. Hey, good morning. Can you hear me all? Yes, but uh, please, yeah, there you go, full screen. Okay, good. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, Bruce Sturk here in the city of Hampton on the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia. Appreciate the opportunity to be here with you this morning. So just a quick overview, I'll uh, share uh, our story about our uh, work with specifically with the uh, Joint Base Langley, Eustis Langley Air Force Base in this particular case is part of the city of Hampton. We do uh, have a robust federal partner presence here, as you can see on the slide. Uh, we're, we're blessed in the sense that uh, this is a great, uh, great relationship with all these uh, significant federal entities here in Hampton. Uh, and obviously, you can see the amount of economic impact and jobs they bring to our community. So we've had a long-standing relationship for 100, 100 years, in some cases, with most of these installations. Uh, but today, I'll really focus in on our work with Langley Air Force Base. It's quite a large installation, covering about 283 acres out there just off of uh, the Little Back River that reaches out into the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, Langley is the oldest uh, active Air Force installation in the nation, and uh, they do a lot of uh, work with respect to intelligence surveillance reconnaissance. They, they host the uh, F-22 Air Supremacy Fighter, the Raptor here, uh, and they've got a lot of uh, missions, uh, Air Combat Command is headquartered there. So since uh, about 2008, uh, we have really been focused on uh, activities underway with respect to uh, compatible land use uh, and resiliency efforts. So our first, uh, our first uh, engagement with Langley back in uh, 2010 was the Cuba JLUS, uh, which resulted in some uh, opportunities to mitigate non-compatible land use and encroachment in and around the installation. From there, we also uh, focused on some resiliency efforts because of the recommendations that came out of the initial uh, JLUS, which was really non-compatible land use uh, and mitigation uh, relative to that uh, project. But the resiliency efforts also 
uh, have helped us understand uh, the relationship with the installation and how we we make them and in the community that surrounds them here in Hampton more resilient to uh, sea level rise and climate issues that we're addressing here. So uh, as you can see on this slide, we've, we've conducted several projects. We are continuing to work on projects with the uh, installation to relocate their gate, which is inside the clear zone. Uh, we're working on uh, uh, access to the installation uh, to try and do some flood mitigation. Uh, we're doing some due diligence on the location for where the uh, new gate will be re relocated. But the bottom line, as you can see, is uh, we like to use other people's money, as I put it. So between the state, city, DOD, REPI, and old CC uh, dollars, we've accumulated approximately $16 million to address a lot of these uh, compatible issues and resiliency issues as we're, as we're working with the installation. Here's a, here's a good picture that depicts what we've been uh, successful over the years of conducting and, and mitigating non-compatible land uses. Uh, the green is really city of Hampton owned properties. Uh, the blue is what we have uh, uh, given restrictive use easements to the installation. They participated through the REPI program with funding. Uh, there are other properties that will turn blue here eventually as we transfer restrictive use easements for the property uh, to the installation. Uh, but you can see that uh, uh, we've really uh, mitigated encroachment in and around the uh, the end of the runway, the clear zone, specifically APZ1, APZ2. APZ2 is an interesting story. Way back in the 70s, the installation came to the city and, and asked uh, to work uh, with us on uh, making that uh, something other than it was a landfill at the time, which created a bird airstrike hazard uh, challenges. So. Uh, the installation and the city uh, acquired that property and now it's a golf course which is compatible in APZ2. Uh, so that was a success story. But we have uh, really started to work uh, encroachment issues in and around the installation. Uh, some of the properties uh, that we've acquired will be actually uh, leased to the installation. Property one and two up, uh, up in the uh, top part of the uh, slide there is where the new gate will be relocated from inside the clear zone, outside the clear zone. So a uh, good success story and continue to work with them on acquiring properties. We do this only through a willing seller uh, process. So the city does not use eminent domain or condemnation to acquire the property. So it's all done through willing seller and and uh, and, and support with the DOD REPI program. Here's some additional uh, overlays of what is out there in the APZ1, the clear zone. You can see a good chunk of that is city owned properties, the Hampton Golf Course. We do have some uh, last developable land in Hampton that we're trying to collaborate with the installation Hampton Road Center North to make sure we're uh, using those uh, final uh, virgin acres uh, appropriately. So there are obviously key legal elements involved in what we've done here. So we uh, we obviously require state, uh, you know, based on what Sabrina said, we too have uh, the AQs uh, that we work with the installation on. And so through that, we also have the real estate disclosures. We have regulations that we've put in place uh, that, that define the zoning uh, and, and the land uses in and around the uh, airfield uh, to include updated building and city codes that individuals that are trying to permit and build in and around the air zone have to work with us on. And we share that information and get coordination and, and make sure that the installation is supportive of any uh, development that occurs around the air zone. We've also uh, created uh, overlay districts uh, in our zoning. Uh, and again, the AQs came into, you know, into play as we did that. Uh, the air installation just uh, updated theirs in 2020 because of the new increase of aircraft, uh, the F-22s that'll be arriving here from Florida uh, to stand up a formal training uh, unit here. But we've also uh, embedded uh, flight approach uh, districts uh, and regulations specifically outlining uh, those things that can be uh, built in compatible uh, uses in the in the zones in and around the airfield. Uh, one last uh, note, uh, the Air Force came to us. The city owns these properties that you see here. Uh, so we're cutting and timbering 118 acres of land. Uh, to allow better visibility for uh, flight operations in and out of the airfield there. The trees were uh, getting upwards of about 80 feet, which were impacting navigational aids and uh, visual flight approaches to the installation. So that project is actually underway now. 
so that clearing of 118 acres of trees will help uh, help flight operations and safety of flight, and and that's a a good thing for us in the Air Force. And over the next 20 to 30, 40 years, uh, probably the trees will grow back again, so we'll be back out there uh, cutting those trees and and making it safe for visibility and flight operations. So uh, as uh, as I noted, we'll uh, at, and address any questions later here, but the city uh, it really appreciates the federal presence we have. And uh, you can see it's quite a significant uh, economic impact for us. So thank you. I'll be uh, passing my uh, uh, screen over to uh, uh, Todd Besser here. And thank you uh, for having me. Good afternoon, everybody. Let's see if I can get everything pulled up. Uh, okay, hopefully you can see my screen. Yep, we're good to go. All right. Uh, like I said, good afternoon. I am Todd Beezer um, with Aberdeen Proving Grounds with the Garrison Department of, or Director of Public Works. Um, I am the lead for our Army Compatible Use Buffer Program which I will get into. Um, so start uh, a little bit with the DOD umbrella, which is a REPI program. Um, all the different service installations actually fall under the authority uh, of the REPI program and each has their own uh, implementation of the REPI authority and ours is the ACO program. Uh, there's a lot of text on this slide, which I don't expect you to read and I'm not gonna read it to you, but I did try to highlight uh, some of the important concepts that falls under the REPI program. And it's the, the key, the goal of the program is to protect military training, testing, and operations uh, by removing or avoiding land use conflicts, uh, and also to address environmental regulatory restrictions that can affect military activities. Um, and this is done through uh, a US Code 2684A, um, which was, it's authorized in the National Defense Authorization Act. I think the first time it came through was 2002 or 2003. Um, and I was just thinking the, the, the part that's very innovative about the way this authority is executed through the NDAA is that it allows it to evolve. Um, over the years, uh, it has been clarified uh, and it's actually been expanded recently in 2019 to allow REPI and the service and uh, implementation actions to address military installation resilience. Um, and, and that comes along the way from energy, water, environment, uh, to address those different needs that the installations um, are experiencing. Um, and to just to echo what Bruce just said, everything hinges on a willing seller. This is not eminent domain. The DOD is not taking land. If the seller says no, we turn around and walk away. Um, so we're trying to establish compatible uses uh, near the installations and ranges uh, and protect natural habitats. Um, we've protected working farms, forests, ranch lands, uh, open space, created and protected recreational space in the community. Uh, for the residents, and it's also used by uh, civilian employees and military families uh, that live and work in, in those communities. And obviously, as you saw from the um, economic impact, all of this uh, really protects local economies, state economies. Um, so again, this is a very old, I call it the amoeba picture of encroachment. Uh, it just it highlights different types of encroachment that are felt upon the installation and that the, the installation creates on the outside community. Um, so the goals, is, again, is to reduce uh, these encroachments going both ways. Um, so again, ACUB is the Army's implementation of, of the code of the authority 2684A. And at APG, we have, we work with cooperative agreements. Uh, they're not contracts, uh, so the difference is the cooperative agreement involves substantial involvement from the government, which is myself and, and folks in my team. Um, so we have two. We have one with Hartford Land Trust, who operates exclusively in Hartford County. And we have another one with Eastern Shore Land Conservancy, 
who works in CISO in Kent counties. Um, and I'll we'll show a little bit more about this uh, in the next couple of slides. Um, so ACUB is a installation driven program. So not every RV installation across the country has an ACUB program. Uh, if an installation is feeling the effects uh, of encroachment or uh, environmental restrictions, or now with the need to, to protect and increase the resilience of the installation, they can develop a proposal and run it through uh, Army Environmental Command and headquarters for approval. And uh, they can begin their ACUP program. Uh, we have uh, basically three lines of funding. Uh, I can fight for installation funding at APG. Uh, we can get it from headquarters. Uh, and then each year, REPI has uh, a proposal process where the installations submit a, a proposal and then it goes up through each service and then at the DOD level they will rate each installation and you're competing against installations and services um, and and that is a congressional line item of funding uh, so it goes right to DOD and then basically how you score is uh, where you fall on a on a cut line list and and they'll distribute funding as it comes in each year um, so it, it's a pretty competitive process. They really scrutinize proposals. Um, so uh, it's it's good to really strengthen up the program and, and how DOD is executing the funding that they receive. I'll go to the next one. So this is getting more into what we're doing at APG. Uh, we just basically we're at the opposite end of the Chesapeake Bay from Hampton. Uh, we're up at the top of the bay. Um, right at the edge of the Susquehanna Flats. Um, this is a, a picture I took when I was up in a helicopter, uh, looking back from the Eastern Shore over to APG. Um, and as you can see, we at APG don't have any natural barriers uh, to the Eastern Shore. Um, so we don't necessarily have uh, development right on our on our fence line, on our boundaries, but there's nothing that, that mitigates our sound. Uh, and, and noise is our main mission driver uh, for our ACUB program. Uh, and as you can see on the right, uh, those are outputs from a noise model that we run uh, not on a daily basis, but on a as needed basis. If there's a large test, if there's uh, atmospheric conditions that, that might uh, indicate that noise will be felt off post. Uh, they'll run. They they mm -hmm. go out at 7:30 in the morning. They put up a three pounds uh, equivalent of TNT and they do a test shot. I think at like 7:30 in the morning. And we have noise monitors all around uh, APG in Harford County, Cecil, Kent, over on Lake Shore, and they'll run these models to find out um, what the effect, what the uh, anticipated effects of the noise would be. Um, if anybody was tracking the news yesterday, I think we had a big test shot that went off sometime around 11 or 12 in the after, or morning, afternoon. Uh, it was felt, uh, from what I read, from Delaware to down in Baltimore County. Um, I personally didn't even hear it in Bel Air. So uh, noise is a very fickle beast. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, people are sensitive to different types of noise, different frequencies, different levels. Uh, so it's a very personal impact as well. So our goal is to preserve APG's mission by limiting noise receptors, basically people in our anticipated noise contours uh, from our from our testing mission. Um, we are a, a research development test evaluation installation. Uh, we have about 90 tenants. Um, and we we researched and test everything from from uh, lab bench scale stuff to to full size weapon systems. Um, so we have static detonations, we have live fire detonations, um, and there's no real set schedule. Uh, it's all year, different weather conditions, um, and we tried to as Sarah stated earlier is that the goal of REPI is to train as we fight. Well, we kind of, at APG, we need to test as we need. 
Uh, we get questions from in theater that we need to turn around quick answers to. We have long-term research projects that get tested. Um, and one of the benefits at APG of having some of the different tenants that we do is we can develop something in the lab, scale it up, and then take it around to a range and test it within days versus having to ship it out west to a different uh, test center in the desert. Um, so we're saving time and money by having everything co-located right on APG. And that's one of the things that we're trying to protect with our ACUB program. And then getting a little more into, so you can see where we work, um, the red line and the blue line are anticipated noise contours from our um, operational noise model that was done, it was updated in 2016, I believe. Um, so you can see it's a little different from the red, yellow, and green areas. The red, yellow, and green areas are our ACUB priority areas. Um, as the proposal goes up through headquarters, we have to develop priority one, two, and three areas. So red is our priority area one, yellow is two, and green is three. Um, they were actually initially drawn on the 2006 noise contour, so things shifted a little bit. Um, but when we developed our proposal, we also were looking at environmental uh, factors, such as we had a biological opinion for the bald eagle, which has since gone away with the recovery of the eagle. Uh, that's why you have some of those outlying uh, priority one areas that were red. Uh, there was a lot of eagle data from those areas. Uh, we looked at wetlands. We looked at uh, at, at the time, total maximum daily load requirements, which again shifted as that program at the state evolved. And then we looked at Maryland's critical area for protection uh, of those types of areas and habitats. So again, we work on both sides of the bay. Uh, I'm going to focus a little more on Hartford County in the next couple slides. Um, these, the red and black parcels, you can see uh, red has some some level of interest or negotiation into the ACUB program with our partners. Uh, the black are parcels that we've closed. Um, so we've done a pretty good job since 2007 when we initiated our program and then we revamped it in 2012. Uh, so again, I'm gonna focus a little more here in Harford County. Um, if you can see kind of in the top center, uh, the, that black parcel, right adjacent to that little green polygon. That little green polygon is our Churchill test area, which is a vehicle test track. We test every vehicle that DOD has. Uh, and at that test track, we can replicate 80% of the world's terrain. Um, and actually the rest of the parcels around that test track are already under some site, some type of conservation easement or protection. Uh, and that parcel was on the market for sale. We worked with Hartford County and Hartford Land Trust and the REPI program, and we're able to get a conservation easement on that. It's about 141 acres and basically protected the life of that test track. Uh, some of the most more recent ones from the last, last year, year and a half, uh, the big black parcel kind of in the middle uh, is, it, it's a big forested parcel, um, which is uh, right now, it's, part of Maryland's program open space. Uh, the conservation fund was actually instrumental in actually buying the parcel from bankruptcy court in Florida. Uh, they were able to hold on to it. And then Maryland uh, program open space and Hartford Land Trust with some of the army money were able to get it into program open space, um, which is, it's awesome. It's a 900 acre forest and it's adjacent to the Maryland uh, stoning demonstration forest here in the middle of Hartford County. Uh, and then you see the two larger black parcels on the shoreline. One, uh, the larger one is Bellevue Farm, which we just closed last fall. I think that's 340 acres, I believe, right on uh, the shores of Susquehanna Flats. Uh, it's a beautiful old historical uh, farmhouse. Again, it's uh, into Maryland's program open space and Hartford County's program open space. And the day we close at, um, we were all sitting out there for the signing ceremony and you could hear the firing ranges of APG. They were, they were basically letting loose that day and it was quite noisy out there. So uh, preventing development on that parcel is pretty important to helping protect our ranges. Um, 
And then you can kind of see some of the other parcels over on the eastern shore that have been preserved uh, with our partners over there. We have some large ones that have been done, um, but just kind of focused on Hartford County right now. Um, so I like to show this uh, slide as well in that we as APG and the military have benefited greatly from other state, uh, local and other federal conservation programs in that these are all non repi easements or some type of land protection that we have benefited from. Um, obviously, 2007, 2012, when our ACUP program really got going, we're, we're relatively newcomers to this game. Um, but for years and years and years, we've gained benefit from all these other programs uh, that have had a longstanding history in the state of Maryland for uh, protecting lands, whether it's forest, farmlands. Um, and it, it's really helped uh, the longevity of Aberdeen Proving Ground. Um, we were established in 1917, so we're over 100 years old. Um, we're one of the premier RTD and e installations in the country. Um, and, and which another unique thing is that we actually own parts of the gunpowder, the bush, and the main stem Chesapeake Bay there. So within that green boundary is our exclusive jurisdiction, um, which is side note why we have a pretty extensive Chesapeake Bay program as well, and why we work with um, DOD's Chesapeake Bay program and, and the state uh, and local DNR um, and a lot of the monitoring programs throughout the state uh, and the Bay. Uh, so I got through that pretty quick. So we have some time for questions when we get to the end, but I will hand it back off. Great, thank you, Todd. And last but not least, we do have Chris Zimmerman. Yeah, yes, good afternoon. It's Chris Zimmerman from Joint Base Andrews. I think I've got about five minutes left um, to go through this uh, quickly. So I'll just uh, continue. Chris, we're having some issues hearing you. Can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you now. Um, I double clicked the button or something like that. But anyway, so I've got about five minutes, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. Um, military installation overlay zones, very similar to what Pax River has. Um, but we uh, did this as a uh, result from our 2009 joint land use uh, study. Um, and I'm just going to go over some of the uh, issues that uh, created the need for this. So Joint Base Andrews was created in 1943. Um, to support the Army Air Corps training. And you can see off to the top left, you know, what the, um, uh, what Joint Base Andrews looked like. And at the time it was uh, Camp Springs. Then you go over to the right, uh, top right corner, 1963, it started to um, change a little bit more. And you can see some of the development, urban development around the, um, around the base. And then 74, you can see even more development. And then obviously 2016, there's even more development. Um, the population has increased 915%, and I think that's probably fairly standard uh, for any sort of um, you know, big urban area. Um, and the population st still continues to increase. We have some major developments happening out to the Northeast. We're about uh, 10,000 homes and 6 million feet of uh, retailer going in. Um, we also employ 17,500 people on base, about 60 to 70% of them are Maryland residents around the local area. And we house more than 100 aircraft and have an economic impact of about $2 billion per year. Ooh, wow, cool. I didn't even see that was going on. That's nice. All right, so mission sustainment uh, used to be um, encroachment management. So now the installation has a mission sustainment team. Um, they provide the um, uh, basic overview of all the different sort of encroachment mission sustainment activities that affect any sort of uh, mission that happens on uh, Joint Base Andrews. We also oversee the um, Installation Complex Encroachment Management Action Plan, or the ICE map that was created in 2012, um, that identifies a lot of the uh, current and future um, um, mission sustainment and encroachment areas. Um, 
we also take into account the installation development plan, which is uh, very similar to a city's master plan or a municipality's master plan. Um, we also take into account the ACUs, which um, uh, previous speakers have already briefed, and the, uh, the, the military installation overlay zone. And a new requirement, um, an annual requirement, is the mission sustainment risk report. And we've identified um, 12 major risks and seven minor risks that are going to, that have impact or that will have impact um, on Joint Base Andrews missions throughout the years. Um, the installation development plan looks at uh, land use off the base. And if you notice the map to the right, um, JBA has um, two spots within Prince George's County, the main base itself, and then a smaller base down to the um, south of it. Um, so we take a look at all the different types of zoning around the, uh, around the installation and how it impacts uh, what we're doing. So here's the military, um, uh, here's, here's the ACUs. Um, you can see all the different uh, defined airspace areas and then the clear zone and accident potential zones already pr uh, presented as well as the um, purple that you can't see very well and the orange, those are our no noise contour areas at different uh, decibel levels uh, based upon um, aircraft that are operating in the area um, or operating on the ground or landing. And those will probably change if we, or when we, they will, they will change when we get new aircraft uh, coming into place. Um, here's the military installation overlay zone mapping that uh, is part of the Prince George's County zoning ordinance um, that was approved in 2015 and then the map was uh, done in 2016 and it incorporates all the safety zones noise contours and air, um, height areas or height surfaces so the map, map amendment um, uh, you know was put into place as well and some of the benefits um, it really helps us identify uh, early um, the different types of urban planning and development that's happening around the, the base um, it gives us an idea of you know you know what we need to look at and what we need to um, comment on for the county to make sure that we don't uh, have an impact to our mission and it also enhances uh, public safety so some of the current issues that we have um, renewable energy development is really having an impact um, solar panels it's not so much the glint glare because the uh, the way the solar panels have been um, uh, you know uh, expanded upon and, in, and innovated um, don't have the glare and glint that they used to have what we do find is that um, the solar inverters uh, provide or produce a large, a large number of uh, or large amount of electromagnetic interference as well as radio interference um, that will impact um, the Brandywine communication site, which you see off to the right. Um, so we're working with the county on how to how to um, establish a buffer zone around that area. Uh, wind turbines um, they will definitely impact a radar and then low-level mission operations. We're taking a look at that through the. Um, uh, DOD's uh, Siting Clearinghouse, as well as other uh, agencies. Um, the county will be updating the MIOZ ordinance in fiscal year 24, so we're going to try to establish a buffer within that MIOZ to protect the Brandywine site. So we also have some of the other um, developments that are happening um, that are exempt. So the, clear, uh, the mound that you see off to the right-hand side, that is literally at the base boundary and uh, at a, it's limited to 150 feet uh, above the ground, um, so it doesn't impact any of the, um, uh, the flight operations. And that's all I've got. Back over to you, Sarah. Great, thank you so much, Chris. Um, so throughout the webinar, we've been assembling quite a number of questions from our audience, and we'll now move into our question and answer session. I know we're running a little short on time, but um, and try to get through as many of these as possible. Um, to that point, you can continue submitting questions as we move into the discussion, um, and, and we'll answer as many as we can get to until 11.30. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I guess the first question that's come up and um, a, a good clarification point. So someone brought up that in Sabrina's presentation, she noticed that the slides are noted as for official use only. Um, I'm not sure what that means, and are the slides available to the general public? Um, and then the, the second part of that question, Sabrina referred to the town center at Pax River. Uh, was there a master plan written for the town center? And if so, is it available to local planners? Sabrina, that question I, I, is for you if, you're, if you can unmute. Can you hear me now? Yep, can hear you. Okay, um, yeah, the for official use only. Well, nothing in there. It was probably just a, a rollover from a previous slide I had done, but 
it's nothing in there was um, secret or classified. Um, as fa far as the installation development plan, um, yeah, I believe that is um, available, maybe not all of it, um, but yes, we do have an installation development plan 2018. I would have to see if it is available to everyone, but you could try to Google it, NAS Pax River installation development plan of 2018, see if you can find it. <clears throat> but if it's available, I'll send it to Jennifer. That one it actually says for official use only, so. Um, but see if you can Google it, maybe you can find it. Great, thank you for that. Um, okay, so next question, this is probably general for the group. Um, for planning purposes, especially transportation planning, it is helpful to have an accurate idea of the number of persons that work on site. A complete estimate of employment on site is often unavailable through federal and state data sources. Um, often national security issues are cited as a reason for this. Is there a reason for planners to get an accurate number of on-site jobs and workers at military facilities and bases? Um, for example, getting an accurate count of employment at Fort Meade or Pax River has been a challenge. Any suggestions? And that was from Sean Kimberly. Do any of our panelists have a, a suggestion for how to go about getting um, accurate idea of the, you know, the makeup of these populations? So I'll just I'll just throw out our relationship with Joint Base Langley Eustis, the Air Force installation. I mean. Uh, they put out uh, every two year an economic uh, impact statement, which gives you a good uh, number of the employment figures on the installation. Uh, we also can ask them directly uh, for the employment numbers uh, as needed, and we generally get that information. Uh, obviously, they have uh, rotations of military service members coming in and out of the community on a recurring basis, so those numbers are kind of an aggregate and approximate, uh, but we generally just go to the base uh, uh, planning office and they share that information with us. Chris, I'm, it looked like you were, oh, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, I would like to add that the state also releases um, every four years a statewide economic impact study that includes employment numbers, and that is available on the Commerce website, the Maryland Commerce website, so I can share that link in the chat. Great, okay, uh, we'll move on to the next one. This one is from Chuck Boyd, and I think this is a good one for our um, CPLOs that are on the line. Uh, just a general question, if a local planning department is interested in starting a conversation about compatible use with its adjacent military facility, how would you recommend they start that conversation and who should they contact? Yeah, so this is Chris Zimmerman from Joint Base Andrews. Um, all members of the public or all members of um, uh, the county uh, planning uh, should contact the base through their public affairs officer and they will um, uh, feed it out to whoever needs to be in contact. So there are a variety of different uh, organizations on base um, that can actually help support that. Okay, uh, next question is from Charnel Hicks. Uh, she says, for Jennifer, I share your passion for this work. What can we do to influence zoning and building code regulations to support compatibility? I think you can probably, I mean, our project really, we're not, we're trying to influence smart energy siting that is collaborative and cooperative. And I think it's important to hear all voices. Um, so we tried to make sure that our steering committee was diverse um, when, um, when planning this project. So we wanted to make sure that we were taking a balanced approach um, between renewable energy development, um, which is important and valuable to our state's economy um, with uh, military installation economic impact, which is equally important to our state's economy. So I think taking a balanced approach and, and hearing all voices is the way to go. Um, you wanna try to find a path that is going to be valuable to everyone and you're gonna, you're gonna get consensus and working towards consensus is probably um, the best advice I could give. Great, thank you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. uh, next question we will go to uh, from Michael Greenwald. 
says, uh, regarding the Patuxent Naval Air Station, if one wanted to replicate the process for creating zones, how does one get the necessary information on the aircraft to generate the noise contours and the AQ's contours? Seems like that would involve getting aircraft information that would not be easily available. Hi, this is Sabrina. So <clears throat> the AQs is done officially by the Navy. So it would be have to have to something that the installation commanding officer would request and they would have their experts who are involved in aircraft, whether it's flying or noise contours to actually get that reproduced. So that's produced by the Navy. Over. Great, thank you, Sabrina. Uh, next question is from Amanda Wilson. Do any of the communities presenting today have zoning overlays for the noise contours of the AQs? Our community has an overlay for APZs, but we are considering trying to expand to ensure compatible development in the noise contours as well and are looking for model ordinances. So I'll, I'll take this one here in Hampton, Virginia, but yes, our GIS department has a AQs overlay uh, which includes the APZs, the clear zones, so all that information is on our GIS site and, and if you're a developer or a homeowner you can actually click on that and see if you're in the noise zone area or if you're in a compatible use area and the, and the specific ordinances and zoning that apply for that particular area. So our GIS department handles that. Great, thank you Bruce. Oh, Sabrina, did you unmute? Did you have something to add to that? No, I don't have anything to add. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Uh, next question is from Jason Dubo. Uh, do military facilities forecast the future extents of APZs, AQs, and noise zones so that local governments can know one to two decades beforehand where they should be planning compatible land use designations? Yeah, so this is Chris Zimmerman from J JBA. So the APZ1, the APZ2, and the clear zone, they are set um, for the, the different type of runways or different type of airfields that are at the military base. Um, and those are located in um, a unified uh, facilities criteria document that you can find online. I believe it's 2-360-01. Um, and those are set. Um, if they need to change, that's a major change, and that would probably be due to the different aircraft uh, types um, that are going to be employed at that airbase. Um, but yeah, so those are those are uh, you know those are completely set. All right, thank you for that, Chris. Uh, next question comes from Alicia Lorber. Um, I think this is a good one for the group. When considering compatible land use planning, I understand the hazards associated with flight path hazard zones, noise and vibration issues, and hazardous material spills. What other activities at military installations should be considered when doing compatible land use planning? Um, also, what types of land uses near military installation could impact operations on base? I'll take a couple of those. Um, so what we found from our joint land use study, uh, some of the research there um, with some of our outline uh, test tracks is uh, building heights uh, because we send data from a test track back to the main installation. Um, so we try to keep a, basically a clear line of sight. Um, and another one that we experience um, is uh, marine trespassing. Uh, since we actually own parts of the rivers in the bay, we constantly have patrols that are chasing uh, recreational boaters, fishermen out of our waters when we're trying to conduct a test. So, uh, you know, just building new marinas, obviously, in the upper bay is going to increase that marine traffic, uh, which could have an impact on the mission and the safety of the community. Uh, so those are two things that I I think are overlooked a lot. Hi, this is Sabrina um, at Pax River. <clears throat> Doesn't have to be like right outside the gate because you'd seen that our Atlantic test range extends all the way into Delaware, but um, some of the things we're um, combating for compatible use is uh, alternative energy 
which the Navy and the DOD is um, an advocate of, but uh, solar farms and wind turbines have um, potential issues. Uh, and we are working both at the Navy level, the local level, and at the federal level to mitigate those problems. Um, some of the problems with the wind turbines, they were causing um, interference with our radar, our Adams radar. So certain heights might might not be um, compatible with our radar, as well as um, solar farms, the glint glare, um, the heat map, and potential for um, CFIUS, which of course I don't remember what the acronym stands for, except that enemies of the United States like to manufacture those uh, solar panels and then could be spying on us. So um, we're working on all those though for the future, over. Great, does anyone else have anything to add to that question before we move on? Alrighty, so our next question, uh, whenever local comprehensive plans are updated, can military facility liaisons assist local planning boards throughout the update process to ensure land use compatibility? Uh, again, Bruce and Hampton, so uh, we uh, bring the uh, base planners into our uh, conversations as we're updating ordinances and zoning overlays and uh, because when they update their AQs, for example, it does have impactments outside the fence line in the community. So uh, we've established a very close uh, collaborative relationship through a memorandum of agreement that's signed by our city manager and the installation commander that kind of talks about the coordination process on those exact types of things that you just asked about, uh, Sarah. All right, thank you, Bruce. And this, this, sorry, this is Sabrina, and for the base side, same way, we have a memorandum of understanding between the base CO and the county commissioners that we will be part of um, any planning that goes on out in the community, over. Great, thank you all. Um, just looking through some of the other questions that we have left, I've noticed that um, one of the big themes, uh, a lot of the questions are talking about resiliency. So if anyone wants to touch on um, how our installations addressing resiliency as an element of compatibility in general. Uh, I'll just share again that here in Hampton, uh, you saw one of my charts really focused on uh, on the resiliency efforts with the installation. Langley is uh, surrounded by a body of water, the Back River and the Chesapeake Bay. So over the years, dating all the way back, at least to one of the major storms we had, Isabel, uh, the installation has, has uh, put in a lot of uh, funding to uh, become more resilient. Uh, pump stations, shoreline restorations, for example, I think they're north of $300 million of uh, resiliency efforts that are helping that installation. But again, community input and the support that we're uh, working because Hampton too is on the on the waterfront, very you know waterfront community. So both of our uh, work on resiliency collaboratively has has made great strides in, in making sure we can live with the water, if you will. And so uh, we have been able to leverage a lot of the DoD old CC funding uh, to work specific resiliency efforts. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? Alrighty, um, and I know we're, we're over time, so I'll just wrap up with one last question. And um, this is from Jocelyn Jones. She's wondering if any of these groups are also working with MDOT and MPOs. Uh, there are several planning documents and activities that occur through transportation. So um, strategic highway military network, uh, state freight plans, asset management plans, engagement of freight stakeholders. Yes, this is Sabrina Hecht. I am working with the MPO here locally, as well as a regional transportation initiative prior to COVID. Um, again, we're a peninsula with as many people that go to the Pentagon 
um, come here to Pax River and we have very little um, public transportation. So I was working with State Highway Administration, our local public works, both the counties locally and our Tri-County Council, as well as the governor's office to help improve transportation. Over. Great, thank you, Sabrina. Uh, I'll just wrap up with this one last question. Uh, someone, just a general question if presentations will be available. Um, I, it was my intention to share all these, the, the slides, they will be uploaded um, as, as well as the recording on the Smart Growth, um, the website. And all of the, the registrants for today's uh, webinar will receive an email when this information is available. So as long as from my presenters that they are comfortable sharing these slides, then yes, everything, all that information will be made available. Okay, so uh, this goes. I'll go ahead and conclude our webinar, Compatible Use and Development with Military Installations. I really want to offer a huge thank you to all of our panelists for great presentations, uh, to everyone who attended, and to John Coleman, who's our communications and technology guru, who has, who has really helped to make all of this happen. Um, like I said, the complete recording and, and all slides from today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. And um, as I mentioned, you'll receive an email with this information. And I encourage you all to keep an eye on your email inbox for details on other future webinars that are hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning. And with that, I hope everyone has a great day and thank you again for joining us.